of this is my duty and for that reason I will do it. If so, he seems to have an implausibly strong doctrine in a, in a couple of ways. One, that this just seems to demand a level of, of conscientiousness that is um, not healthy and not practical. And uh, second, that it would seem to deny justice and praiseworthiness to actions that one would expect Anselm to commend. So take Sandra and Thomas. Sandra goes to church because she takes it to be her duty to go to church. Thomas goes to church because he loves God above all else and wants to praise and thank him. Um, are we to say that Sandra is just and praiseworthy because she has chosen rectitude for its own sake and Thomas is not? Well, given the connection between teleology and rectitude, it would be an embarrassment, surely, for Anselm if, in this case, it was Thomas alone who fulfilled his God-given purpose by loving God above all else, and Sandra alone who attained or preserved rectitude by doing what she ought because she ought. Let's look at moral knowledge first. As I've already said, rationality simply is, consists in, the ability to distinguish right from wrong. So as I like to say, God gave us reason so that we could act rightly, not so that we could be good at metaethics. Or uh, to quote Hursthaus again, of course people can be virtuous without putting in clockable hours talking about eudaimonia. Um, and we see in the letters that when Anselm gives moral advice, he doesn't give theory. He gives perhaps the bare minimum. He never suggests that his correspondents need to investigate deeper moral, uh, theological, philosophical questions than have already occurred to them. So he's, he's not a victim of the Platonic uh, fantasy. And it seems pretty clear that for Anselm, all sorts of things are going to count as being aware of uh, rectitude. As a general rule, we will know what to do by knowing what our earthly superiors uh, require of us. And I think I'm going to skip some long quotations from, uh, from some letters. But, but that's the basic idea, right? Knowing God's will is not a terribly complicated thing. Just ask your abbess, and she will be happy to tell you what God wants for you. Um, but suppose you don't have explicit instructions. Or suppose you're trying to discern whether what you're being asked to do or told to do is contrary to the, to the divine will. How do you do that? Easy, he says in this letter to uh, Robert and his nuns. The nuns are a small community drawn from the Anglo-Saxon nobility. He um, says, look, if you want to know whether what you're thinking about doing or willing is right, just ask yourself, does God will that I will this? Or does he not? And he continues, if your conscience replies, God truly does will that I will this, and this will of mine is pleasing to him, then cherish that will, whether or not you were able to carry it out. But if your conscience bears witness to you that God does not will for you to have that will, then turn your heart away from it with all your energy. So Anselm is confident in general that a rightly disposed person, that is, someone who in general is seeking to live a godly life, will know what God wants that person to do. If we don't know, it's probably, he says, because we're weighing our own desires too heavily. Um, there's a monk named Henry who found, found out, he was, he was one of the monks of Christchurch Canterbury, he found out that his sister in Italy uh, had somehow, and again we don't know the details, fallen into the hands of some unscrupulous rich man who was subjecting her to servitude of some unspecified sort, and Anselm writes to him, because he wants to go now rescue her, do something about it. Anselm writes to him and says, don't do it. Your vows require you to stay put. And look, we're all slaves to somebody or something. So she's a slave to some rich man, you know, whatever. Um, stay put. But that's not the interesting part, because we've already seen that Anselm is pretty inflexible about these things. The interesting part is that he gives it an explanation of where Henry's thoughts have gone wrong. He says, if we join the weight of our love to the weight of the thing loved we will undoubtedly be deceived in our judgment about the matters on which we have to make a decision. If Henry weighed his options rightly, he would see that the very little good to be done by his travel to Italy is vastly outweighed by the disobedience and the various inconveniences and disadvantages of his going, but he has put his desire to go on the scales illicitly and so tampered with the balance. So in general putting aside personal preferences of that kind. It's easy to know what God wants us to do. We just ask ourselves, and yet. When, August, when Anselm is Archbishop of Canterbury, he claims at least, and I take him at his word for this, that he doesn't know 
what God's will is. And he writes this letter to Pope Urban II, which I've mentioned before, absolutely agonizing. I long, he says, to escape from the unbearable anxiety, to lay down the burden, yet on the other hand, I fear offending God. Fear of God compelled me to take up this burden, and that same fear compels me to keep bearing it. If I discerned God's will in these matters, I would undoubtedly devote my will and my actions to it to the best of my ability. But since God's will is now hidden from me, and I do not know what I am to do, I sigh, wandering aimlessly. Well, we know that Anselm earnestly and seriously and intensely sought to conform his will to the will of God. To the will of God. And yet, those are the very conditions under which we ought to be able to discern readily and easily what God wants. Why here could he not discern God's will? Why is God's will now hidden from me? And I think the answer is the same as it was for his, his friend uh, Hugh earlier, uh, or Henry rather, that he, um, he really wanted out. He was miserable. These kings were driving him crazy. His bishops were rebelling. He wasn't getting to do his theological work. He, he knew himself to be utterly incompetent as an administrator. He didn't take himself to be doing any good. He wasn't able to lead the kind of monastic life that he truly valued and to talk philosophy with people, which is what he really wanted to do. And, and so he just wasn't thinking properly, couldn't think properly, or maybe just wouldn't think properly. Because this is a key lesson that I think Anselm in general wants us to learn, though he doesn't acknowledge it here. Problems in doing what's right for him always come down to the will and not to the intellect. And ultimately, if you press him on this, he's going to have to say, to be consistent with his theory and his usual way of thinking about these things, yeah, I know what God's will is. Um, it's just that I don't want it. I'm fighting against it. Ultimately, it comes down to the will. Sin is always ultimately pinned on the will, not on intellectual shortcomings. So awareness of rectitude, which is what all of this concerns, knowing what is right, is a fairly minimal requirement. It doesn't require sophisticated teleological views. He doesn't commit the platonic fantasy. And it's not even particularly hard. We, we don't need a theory. We just need to ask our superiors. Or failing that, ask, as he says, our own conscience. But there is that second problem. What about preserving rectitude of will for its own sake? What does that come to? Well, he never offers us a positive account of that. But he does offer sort of three things such that if they're the case, you're not doing it. Um, and it, it looks as if when none of these three conditions apply, you're okay. Um, these conditions are this. If you do the right thing in ignorance, that's not doing it for its own sake. If you do the right thing because you're forced to, that doesn't count. If you do it for the sake of some extraneous reward, as he puts it, because you're bribed, uh, as he also says. That doesn't count. But if you do the right thing, knowing that it's the right thing, and it's not for any of those reasons, it seems to count as doing the right thing, more or less for the right reason. As uh, Jeffrey Brower has noted, justice for Anselm is not a particular volition or series of volitions, but a disposition. That is, justice looks more like a virtue than like a particular volition. But you have to be really careful with this, because, especially around here, where there are real live Aristotelians running around, which is a wonderful thing, that we don't start thinking of this as an Aristotelian sort of virtue, as an Aristotelian hexis of the sort that, uh, that we get in the Nicomachean Ethics. That is, justice for Anselm is not a stable character trait firmly re rooted as a result of, hi of habituation and therefore not easily or quickly lost. First of all, we don't acquire it by habituation. It's bestowed by God. Um, it is not strengthened or made stable by habituation. If we make progress in the moral life, this will not be a natural consequence of habituation, but a divine gift. Moreover, and this is a point that he insists on quite emphatically, justice is easily lost. Unlike an Aristotelian virtue, justice is extremely easy, easily lost. So he warns some monks, this is the devil. It's also St. Bernard, who's not really relevant here, but, but there's the devil. Our crafty enemy often deceives us by persuading us that not much hangs on such things. He said, look, don't think anything in the monastic life is small. But what follows is the grave harm of which we read in Scripture, one who does not heed small things falls, little by little. And in another wonderful letter he says, the present life is a journey. Yeah, I know, the present life is a journey, but keep, stay with me. We are always either ascending or descending. Always either going upwards towards heaven or downwards towards hell. 
When we do some good work, he says, we take one step upwards. When we sin in any way, we take one step downwards. And it is important, he says, to recognize that one goes downwards far more quickly and easily than upwards. For this reason, he says, in every will and in every act, Christian men and women ought to pay attention to whether they are on the upward or the downward path. For this reason, any disobedience, however apparently trivial, is a grave evil. He says, do not suppose that any sin is small, though granted some sins are greater than others. Here we have the expulsion from paradise. He says, no act of disobedience ought to be called small. Disobedience alone expelled human beings from paradise. What is one of his favorite images for the monastic life? Eden. You can be expelled from the monastic life for an act of disobedience. Um, There's a wonderful uh, letter to a young monk who has been told to copy manuscripts. And he doesn't want to. And Anselm writes this long letter saying, basically, do what you're told. It's a big deal. You don't think it's a big deal, but every act of disobedience is, in fact, a big deal. Although you have expertise in copying manuscripts, you would rather do anything else that seems better to you than to copy them obediently. And he goes on to say, all you have to do in order to be obedient is to will it. The circumstances may be unpropitious. Your desires and emotions may not be cooperative. That doesn't matter. Rectitude of will is always possible. Rectitude of will, and this he will argue this theoretically elsewhere, says it more practically in this letter, rectitude of will is never taken away. It is only thrown away. Circumstances never force you. Your desires never force you. Ignorance never forces you not to have uprightness of will. If you lose it, it's because you've thrown it away, and you are throwing it away, and that's a very serious thing. So Anselmian justice lacks many of the most salient features of an Aristotelian virtue, not acquired by habituation. It does not guarantee uh, just action. It is easily lost. And just to sort of flesh out the moral theory quickly, it's worth noting there are other indications that the role of virtue in Anselm's theory is fairly minimal. One is that except for justice, the vocabulary of the traditional cardinal virtues, the big four, uh, almost never appears in Anselm. Temperance, for example, is, is never, the word temperantia, never appears in Anselm so far as I can find. And that, if you think about it, is a very odd thing for a monastic writer in this tradition. Everything hinges on justice. And if you think about virtue as a disposition that prompts you to perform virtuous acts reliably, readily, and with pleasure, Anselm just doesn't actually think there are any. We've already seen that reliability is not there. You have justice, but it's easily thrown away. We fall, we get on the downwards path quickly and easily. As far as doing things reliably and with pleasure, that's really going to depend for Anselm on the state of our emotions. And Anselm doesn't really seem to envision any possibility of training the emotions. You can train the will for him. It doesn't seem that you can train the emotions so that they accord with reason's judgment. So you, you just don't get that in Anselm. And this, I take it, explains why charity plays such a small theoretical role in Anselm. 